This talk is entitled, Training Amidst Tragedy. It was offered on September 16, 2001, by Rev. Master Echo Little, Abbot of Shasta Abbey. This audio file is copyrighted by its speaker. Permission is hereby granted to allow the listener to make copies for personal use or non-commercial distribution, provided each copy contains the complete file, including this copyright notice. No commercial uses, altering, changing, or transcribing is permitted without the written consent of the speaker. Homage to the Buddha, homage to the Dharma, homage to the Sangha. I pray that I and all sentient beings from this life through all future lives will ever be able to hear the true teachings. Once I have heard the true Dharma, I will not harbor doubts about it or fail to trust in it. Right at the time when I encounter the true Dharma, I will let go of the whole world and embrace the Buddha's teachings. Then, together with all beings on this great earth, may we fulfill the way. Think back a week ago and see what the meaning of impermanence and suffering is. I'm going to postpone our talk on the third vow of Samantabhadra until sometime in the future and instead talk more about the teaching of the Buddha and how to keep one's training going in the midst of events and conditions that create terror, tragedy, uncertainty and how we can take refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha regardless of those conditions. This morning, when I was thinking about what to talk about, I remembered a very poignant story from the life of the Buddha. And it is one that is said to have occurred either in his later years, uh, sometime after his 80th year had passed, or possibly in the last year of his life. According to legend, at least, he died when he was 84. And this story is about the annihilation of the Shakya clan. If you remember the Buddha's name, he was always referred to as Shakyamuni Buddha. Shakyamuni means sage of the Shakya clan. And his family was the clan, tribe, who inhabited the area of Kapilavastu in the kingdom of Kosala in ancient India. At that time, King Pasanadi was the king of Kosala, and Shakyamuni's father was also a king, but of a smaller kingdom. And the political events of the time were such that many of the larger kingdoms were, as uh, history has shown us, uh, conquering the smaller kingdoms. Now, in this particular case, the king of Kapilavastu, Shudodana, Shakyamuni's father, 
And King Pasanadi had a very good relationship. But the king's son, Virudaba, King Pasanadi's son, Virudaba, had it in for the Shakyans. And the reason why he had it in for the Shakyans is part of the story, which I will read to you one version of. King Pasanadi, the king of Kosala, decided to make a Shakya woman his chief wife and sent messengers to Kapilavastu saying, I wish to establish blood ties with you. Give me one of your daughters as a wife. On hearing the proposal, the Shakyas conferred among themselves saying, We live under the authority of the king of Kosala. If we refuse to give him a Shakya woman as wife, we will fall prey to his great anger. However, if we do send a Shakya woman to him, our lineage will be ruined. What are we to do? Mahanama volunteered his own daughter, Vasaba Katiya, born of the slave woman Nagamunda, suggesting that they declare that she was, the, she was of the Katiya class. The Katiya class was the warrior class. You had Brahman, Katiya, something else, and Sudra. I don't remember the name of the third caste. It mainly, uh, well, my knowledge of Indian history is uh, a little shaky, so I won't say any more on that. But anyway, they were going to give this lady to the king of Kosala claiming that she was a noble woman when instead she would be regarded as the lowest caste there is. Thereupon she was taken to Savati and became the principal wife of the king. Soon she gave birth to a prince who was Vidudabha. When he was 16 he went to his mother's homeland and was treated disdainfully because of his mother's low caste. He discovered the cause when a female servant washing the seat he had occupied in the meeting hall with a mixture of milk and water muttered insultingly, this is where the son of Asaba Katia, the slave woman, sat. Hearing her derogatory remark, the prince thought, go ahead and wash the place where I sat with milk and water. When I become king, I will wash the seat with the blood of your throat. When Vidudaba returned to Kosala, the king was informed of the deception and the prince's mother's low caste. He lost all his respect for mother and son and only gave them allowances appropriate to slaves. Okay. Um, I'm sorry that this is the traditional response. Um, Blame the woman and her child, uh, not the people who did it. That kind of karma comes later, I'm afraid. A short while later, Gotama called on the king and said to him, this would have been the Buddha, the Shakyas have done wrong, great king. If they gave a woman, they should have given one of their own blood. But I say this to you, La Sabakatiya is a king's daughter and was consecrated in the house of a Katiya king. Virudaba too, Vidudaba, was begotten by a Katiya king. Wise men of old have said, what does a mother's clan matter? The father's clan is the measure. Then he told the king the Katahari birth story, which I believe is a Jataka story, but I'm not sure. Hearing it, the king was very pleased and restored mother and son to their former status, saying, the father's clan is the measure. After Vidudaba became king, he recalled his resentment, 
and determined to destroy every member of the Shakya clan, set out with a large army. That day, the Buddha, looking out over the world at dawn, knew that his relative's clan was to be destroyed and thought, I must help my kin. After going out early on his alms round, receiving offerings, and returning to his perfume chamber, he lay down like a lion. When evening came, having passed through the air, he sat down near Kapilavatu, at the foot of a tree that gave little shade. Very close by, on the border of Vidudaba's territory, was a huge banyan tree with dense foliage. Now, some of the accounts say the Buddha just went there, and other accounts are more magical, saying that he meditated where he was and his spirit went there. Seeing the Buddha, Vidudaba approached and saluted him, saying, Venerable one, why are you sitting in this heat at the foot of a tree that gives little shade? Please sit beneath the huge banyan tree with dense foliage over there. Gotama replied, Leave me, great king. The shade of my kin keeps me cool. Uh, The story says that the Buddha was sitting under a dead tree at that point. Hearing that, the king thought the master has come here to protect his kin. He saluted the Buddha and then turned around and returned to Savati with his army because he was on the march at that point. The Buddha also returned to the Jetavana monastery. Again, the king recalled his resentment and went out for the second time. Seeing the Buddha there, he returned. A third time he went out and seeing the Buddha there, again returned. However, when he went out for the fourth time, the Buddha observed the former deeds of the Shakyas and saw that it was impossible to eradicate the results of their evil action, like casting poison in the river, and he did not appear a fourth time. King Vidudaba then killed all members of the Shakya clan, beginning with the infants, and washed the seat with the blood of their throats before returning. Some stories say that uh, Shakyamuni sat on the hillside overlooking the plain where this battle took place and simply sat in meditation and cried. There are other accounts where uh, he just did not appear that day. And so... Uh, the uh, Kosalan king, Vidudaba, who certainly had a full head of steam and revenge at that point, uh, went ahead with his plans and exterminated the Shakya clan. Now, there are two lessons in this. One is that it is impossible to escape the consequences of collective karma. And the second lesson is that when such a cruel thing happens, the most spiritually effective thing one can do is to continue with one's training, and practice right in the midst of it, which is what the Buddha did. I am not telling you this story in order to point out anything of a political or social nature. I am simply telling you this story because this is something that happened in the time of the Buddha and I see some parallels in our current situation. Not only for us, but for all the countries in the world right now. 
There is another story which I'm going to read to you and something I have cited before and uh, from which I have received some criticism for in some way sanctioning killing. And I'm going to, before I read you this story, I'm going to read to you the precept that monks take in relationship to killing in the Mahayana Buddhist and Zen tradition. This is a direct quote from the scripture of Brahma's net. The Buddha said, disciples of the Buddha, should you yourself kill willfully cause killing, I'm sorry, willfully cause another to kill, encourage someone to kill, extol killing, take pleasure in seeing killing take place, deliberately wish someone dead, intentionally cause death, supply the instruments or means for killing, cut off a life even when sanctioned by law, that is, participate in any way in killing. You are committing a serious offense, warranting exclusion. Pray, do not intentionally kill anything whatsoever which has life. As a bodhisattva, awaken within yourself a heart that is unending in its mercy and compassion, respect and dutifulness and use your skillful means to help and protect all sentient beings. Hence, should you act from a selfish, indulgent, or reckless heart, and thereby intentionally and willingly take a life, you are a bodhisattva who is committing a serious offense, warranting exclusion. Now, exclusion here for monastics means you will be expelled from the Sangha as a monk. And that's it. In most Buddhist countries, there is no redress for that. You're out. The story that I told and which someone believed that I was somehow uh, supporting justified violence, killing or war, was a story that came from a book that was written by a man named uh, Paul Karras called The Gospel of Buddha. And this book appeared at a time when Buddhism was just making itself or just making its real appearance in the West. It had only been known to scholars up till that point. And many of the some of the scholars and many of the writers who had been deeply affected by the teachings of the Buddha realized that in the West, which was primarily Christian, they were going to have a huge public relations problem in trying to bring a, an Eastern religion to the attention of many Western people. So there was a current among some of the Western literature that appeared at the end of the 1800s and the early 1900s. It appeared as a, as a transition between Christianity and Buddhism. It emphasized the similarities of Christianity with Buddhism. And then at a certain point, it left Christianity behind and went on to Buddhism. 
And as a result, many of the stories and the books and the writings appear almost as an apologia for Buddhism. Because the writers knew that they were not going to have people listen to them if they said, you know, there's this other religion and it's really great and it's called Buddhism. Would you like to hear about it? And the first question people would ask was, well, do they believe in God and Jesus Christ? Well, no, but it's really a wonderful thing. I don't want to listen. Okay. That's where most people were in those days. So these writers had to bridge the gap. And Paul Karras was one of these writers. And in his writing, in this particular book, which he called The Gospel of Buddha, okay, the gospel, the use of the word gospel was not a mistake. It was not a coincidence, you know. He wrote a story that was probably taken from the Bhagavad Gita, which, as some, if not all of you know, um, is a Hindu text. It's not a Buddhist one. However, it does present a side of Buddhism that has been practically adopted in many Buddhist countries when faced with the practical or inevitable prospect of war. So I'm going to read it to you again and possibly infuriate the person who I infuriated before, but I'm hoping to widen all of our views. This was a dialogue between uh, General Simha and the Buddha. And as I said before, and I want to make absolutely clear, you do not find this story in the original Buddhist scriptures. However, there is, it makes some interesting points. Simha, the general, said, One doubt still lurks in my mind concerning the doctrine of the Blessed One. Will the Blessed One consent to clear the cloud away so that I may understand the Dharma as the Blessed One teaches it. The Tathagata, having given his consent, Simha continued, I am a soldier, O Blessed One, and am appointed by the king to enforce his laws and to wage his wars. Does the Tathagata, who teaches kindness without end and compassion with all sufferers, permit the punishment of the criminal? And further, does the Tathagata declare that it is wrong to go to war for the protection of our homes, our wives, our children, and our property? Does the Tathagata teach the doctrine of a complete self-surrender so that I should suffer the evildoer to do what he pleases and yield submissively to him who threatens to take by violence what is my own? Does the Tathagata maintain that all strife, including such warfare as is waged for a righteous cause, should be forbidden? The Buddha replied, He who deserves punishment must be punished, and he who is worthy of favor must be favored. Yet at the same time, he teaches to do no injury to any living being, but to be full of love and kindness. These injunctions are not contradictory, for whosoever must be punished for the crimes which he has committed suffers his injury not through the ill will of the judge, but on account of his evil doing. His own acts have brought upon him the injury that that the executor of the law inflicts. When a magistrate punishes, let him not harbor hatred in his breast. Yet a murderer, when when put to death, should consider that this is the fruit of his own act. 
as soon as he will understand that the punishment will purify his soul, that the consequences he is receiving is as the result of his own karma. He will no longer lament his fate, but rejoice at it. And the Blessed One continued, The Tathagata teaches that all warfare in which man tries to slay his brother is lamentable. But he does not teach that those who go to war in a righteous cause after having exhausted all means to preserve the peace are blameworthy. He must be blamed who is the cause of war. The Tathagata teaches a complete surrender of self, but he does not teach a surrender of anything to those powers that are evil, be they men or gods or the elements of nature. Struggle must be, for all life is a struggle of some kind. But he that struggles should look to it lest he struggle in the interest of self against truth and righteousness. He who struggles in the interest of self so that he himself may be great or powerful or rich or famous will have no reward. But he who struggles for righteousness and truth will have great reward, for even his defeat will be a victory. Self is not a fit vessel to receive any great success. Self is small and brittle, and its contents will soon be spilt for the benefit and perhaps also for the curse of others. Truth, however, is large enough to receive the yearnings and aspirations of all selves. And when the selves break like soap bubbles, their contents will be preserved, and in the truth they will lead a life everlasting. He who goeth to battle, O Simha, even though it be in a righteous cause, must be prepared to be slain by his enemies, for that is the destiny of warriors. And should, should his fate overtake him, he has no reason for complaint. But he who is victorious should remember the instability of earthly things. His success may be great, but be it ever so great, the wheel of impermanence may turn again and bring him down into the dust. However, if he moderates himself and extinguishing all hatred in his heart lives his downtrodden adversary up and says to him, Come now and make peace and let us be brothers, he will gain a victory, for that is not a transient success, for its fruits will remain forever. Great is a successful general, Osimha, but he who has conquered self is the greater victor. I cannot say to you this is the teaching of the Buddha because this has not appeared in the scriptures. However, it is an important story that we should all think about in the days and weeks and months and years to come. Believe me when I tell you wholeheartedly I am not making a political and social statement. I am a religious person and vowed to peace and the eradication of killing. But I will present to you the teachings of the Buddha and how the Buddha and his disciples and other Buddhists have responded to these questions over the years. Because in the days and weeks and months and years to come, you too will be forced to find the answers within yourself. Remember the Buddhas are only teachers. It is we who practice the way and walk the way alone, accepting the karmic consequence of our actions. If we do something, if we do not do something, if we act, if we do not act, we make karma because this is a world 
in which one cannot escape karmic consequence. It is inevitable and it is inexorable. Once the wheel of karma has been set in motion, for good or for ill, the consequences must play themselves out. And all and what we can do is do the best we can as human beings to live in the best way we know how. To cease from evil, do only good, and do good for others. I mentioned to the group of people who came for the memorial service that we had on the 13th that Reverend Master had a very interesting perspective on events and had a very interesting sense of the pulse of the world. She had lived through uh, World War II and uh, still suffered from uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome because of the bombing experience that she had been through. Bombing experience says that she had been through uh, during World War II. In those days, post-traumatic stress syndrome was not, how do you treat a whole country for that? And many people in her generation, as soon as they heard a loud noise, would be under the nearest table, just out of reaction, before they stopped to look to see uh, where that noise was coming from. She was lucky. She didn't have that reaction, but did get very uh, ill when there were thunderstorms. What we call normal life is the normal or socially acceptable level of greed, hate, and delusion that is operating at the moment. If you look at history, you will see that line moving up and down according to events, cultures, cataclysms, victories, tragedies, joys, success, failure. What people, what people generally regard as acceptable and good or evil changes throughout time. It is something that is impermanent. It is something that flows and it is something that is subject to change. Reverend Master used to say that during a war, the sanity line dropped. And what was usually considered as that which was basically your normal level of greed, hate, and delusion, or what was good, acceptable, and decent, was dropped. And you hit a different level, usually lower down on the scale. And that was regarded as acceptable for that period of time. And then in peacetime, it would rise again. Sometimes when it rose, it would actually rise above what one had called normal to begin with because the experience had so changed everyone that the last thing in the world they wanted 
was to ever have that kind of thing happen again. And there was often a great uh, response on the part of humanity actually towards enlightenment because the necessity of kindness and compassion and any of the things that it would help relieve the current circumstances or the ordeal that people had been through, this is what the world wished to cultivate. My own commentary on this is that we suffer from two curses. One we forget very easily. And also the second is we are not all students of history. Because if we were, we would learn something very important. And we would see that the wheel of karma is really the only just law there is. Good begets good, suffering begets suffering. And this kind of good and this kind of suffering can appear not only in one generation, but throughout many generations and many countries and at many times. We live in a world where in Buddhism we call this the world of birth and death. We call it the world of samsara. There are two things which characterize samsara. One is its violence and its viciousness. And the second is the confusion and bewilderment beings feel when they are born herein. It is said in Mahayana Buddhism that samsara is nirvana or perhaps it is it holds within it the potential for nirvana if beings wish to recognize that and wish to practice in that way and so when that sanity line drops and you see and experience or are even part of the violence and viciousness which people perpetrate upon each other. Even in the midst of that, there is the opportunity for training. There is the opportunity for loving kindness there is the opportunity for peace. And it begins with an individual. And that is how it spreads. During the revolution in Cambodia, when the... uh, Khmer Rouge took over the country. Uh, as some of you probably know much better than I, the estimates were that you know, roughly three or four million of the population disappeared. Well, of that three or four million, uh, I've heard statistics that three to five hundred thousand of them were monks. And some monks escaped into other countries, and many didn't. There is a man who still is alive, who some of us met 
this past year, wasn't it? Yes, a year ago. Uh, I was not fortunate enough to meet him, who was a very great monk, well-respected. And he started crossing the border back into Cambodia when some of the, uh, when the Khmer Rouge were still in power to visit a number of the refugee camps. And his message was a message of loving kindness. And he made every effort to teach loving kindness to people who had had all of their families and really their entire society destroyed. And in one particular camp, he started building a temple made of bamboo. And the Khmer Rouge told him, well, you can't do that. You know, and basically anybody who gets involved in this is going to be killed. And the venerable Mahagosananda completely ignored them, went ahead and built the temple, and 20,000 people attended its consecration. And nobody got killed. Whether or not this was a good, a bad, a wise thing, I cannot say. It was the action of courageous Buddhists who had a message of peace. One of the things that living in the world of birth and death teaches a Buddhist is that the most important response that we can make to birth and death is the response of enlightenment. And this enlightenment, whether we be monks or lay people or Buddhists or non-Buddhists, is only something that we can practice. We cannot forcibly require others to practice because true enlightenment, true compassion, true loving kindness come from one's heart. And they come from that heart voluntarily because this is what we wish to do because we believe that this is what is truly right. And that that is always dangerous and a risk. But as we have seen recently, and another thing that these events have brought home to us, is that life is very dangerous. The world of birth and death is violent, and it is vicious. And it never stops being that way until we and all beings are enlightened. That is how it stops. The purpose of Buddhism its main purpose and its only purpose is to teach human beings how to cease from suffering. This is what the Four Noble Truths are. They teach the how to recognize suffering, what it is. They teach its cause, which always begins with oneself. They teach its cessation, which also only begins with oneself. And it teaches the practice or the way to 
awaken and make real that cessation. Again, that is, that is its purpose. There has been in our culture not so much in Buddhist cultures but a lot in Western culture the a uh, to call it politely a dialogue um, to perhaps call a uh, shovel a shovel an argument about the relationship between action and contemplation. In Buddhist countries, it is well known that monks do not engage in killing in in any way whatsoever. And there are real-life examples of monks who have protested oppression by burning their own bodies or in response to terrorist attacks have vocally called for the violent destruction of those who have perpetrated these attacks. 